So thank you for coming to this session. This talk has a bit of history. Um, last year I was supposed to give roughly the same talk at Samba XP conference. And I lost my voice a day before the, uh, the talk happened. Or it did not happen because I lost my voice. That luckily was a remote conference, so I didn't need to give a talk or travel somewhere without a voice. Um, fast forward, this year we got a, a repeating set of the problems uh, that prompted me to give this talk again at Samba XP. This time it was in May and offline, so I came actually there gave this talk and DEFCON talk is, is a variation of, of that talk because we actually got some news in meantime and some fixes in meantime so that's great so you get news that we didn't have even a month ago so who we are um, we both from Red Hat we work on Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux actually on the uh, Red Hat Identity Management which includes all things that you typically associate with enterprise environments. No, we are not the guys who fix your printer even though we do know how to fix printers but we are the guys who fix your uh, Active, Di Active Directory compatibility, Kerberos and all related stuff. And Julian is maintaining uh, MIT Kerberos uh, at Red Hat. I'm doing a bunch of stuff related to free APA mostly these days, but also uh, Samba, a lot of the other actual Samba maintainers at, at Red Hat. And um, the most important part here is that we try to represent our experience as application developers compared to crypto module developers and regulatory body that establish certain requirements and standards. So this um, talk is about our journey in, in the world of FIPS 140. Uh, this is just a reminder, of, um, I'm sure most of the people in this room know what uh, FIPS 140 is, but it's like almost 30 years right now for the introduction of this uh, set of specifications and the uh, previous 140-2 uh, standards was accepted in uh, 2001 so in fast forward to 2022 we have 140-3 as a set of uh, requirements towards all all crypto in the uh, computing systems used in the governmental environment, but it's not only governmental environments, it's also um, everyone who wants to have uh, a bit more secure requirements to, towards their systems. <coughs> so if we compare with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, this was the state in, in Rally, right, with the FIPS 140-2. There were how many? Five crypto modules certified, and a giant amount of work was done to reroute all the other applications from implementing their own crypto to actually use these uh, modules that were then certified. So, when the module certified and applications don't implement their own crypto and use the certified crypto, they can work in the uh, um, FIPS environment and be compliant with some, of, at least some of those regulations. Uh, the actual reality is, is much more complex. You have to take the business requirements into account in addition to the technical limitations in, and the actual regulatory bodies uh, mandates and so on. So in, in many cases you might have something that deviates the actual requirements but it's agreed between the FIPS auditor business and, and the technical things. We as a vendor in, in many cases have to provide means to enable or disable that behavior. But we, 
we sort of aim into providing strict FIPS compatibility in the defaults. And uh, this is the current state of um, FIPS 140-3 in RHEL 9. And you will see that there is this cryptographic module validation program, there are implementations under test. If you go by that link, you will get a huge set of uh, modules from different vendors. Actually, a lot of different vendors. So Red Hat has, again, these five submissions. We mostly focus here in this talk on um, our experiences with uh, OpenSSL uh, FIPS provider as submitted by the Red Hat. But you can see or can not notice that it's already a year in the uh, uh, implementation of the test uh, status. And um, the uh, 140-3 edition um, has a lot of changes. So from our perspective, there's a lot of deprecated functionality you, you cannot use. Um, sometimes this is, these changes apply or be advertised already after you submitted the module for, for the uh, certification. So for example, um, FIPS 186-5 removes uh, DSA completely. It's not, it's not there anymore. It's published in February. So half, half a year past the module was submitted. 180-4 is being revised, it's still not fully revised to remove SHA-1. The announcement came also, I think, in February uh, for that one. In general, uh, some um, initial work is being done by NIST and other bodies to enable um, these standards being really uh, implemented uh, by um, introducing RFCs, changes and so on, so like TLS um, ciphers and so on. But this only applies to the kind of major ones. Uh, if you're working with the protocols that are um, out of scope for, for these regulatory bodies, then, then you get an interesting situation. So like with the Kerberos, the uh, encryption types were updated by NSA proposal, but uh, all related other RFCs around Kerberos weren't updated. So we, so we get some conflicts there. And again, I, I should remind that compliance is really literally what a customer running a system makes with their FIPS auditor and vendors involved. It's, it's not like a technical state uh, known in advance. So if we look into the uh, SHA-1 transition announcement, then we, we can see that, well, <clears throat> the requirement is to get SHA-1 um, gone by the end of um, 2030. But the reality is that the guidance is given right now. So if you have a, a certified uh, module, then that certified module now is, um, well, there, there are none, uh, at least on, on what we uh, uh, care about. Um, the all implementations on the test. And um, laboratories basically say, these guidelines apply now, not in 2030. You have time to prepare, but if we certify modules, we have to do it now. Which means all laboratories have some different feeling towards these um, guidance. And um, the most important for us is, okay, SHA-1 is not allowed. Uh, it affects some all the crypto, um, specifically in the Kerberos case. Um, crypto modules cannot instantiate kind of non-well-known curves where, whether, whenever this is uh, needed. Um, certain API might be asked to be removed completely. The, the whole certification process is, is literally 
throw a module for investigation, get feedback, and repeat multiple times. And sometimes it, it takes months, sometimes days to get the feedback. Uh, and it's always uh, interesting to find the problems literally uh, close to when your product has to be released. And then you have to, to do some, I don't know, fire burns or something uh, with all of this. So the reality that we have now is that if you take the strict understanding of 140-3, then you cannot interoperate with Active Directory, period. This is not possible because there are no overlapping uh, cryptography primitives that could be used at all. So Active Directory only supports the uh, ciphers in, in, in Kerberos uh, from the RFC 3962, which is using the uh, Kerberos key derivation function that is not allowed anymore. Then on the other side, they all use SHA-1, which is being asked not to be allowed anymore. And, okay, you could use it to verify legacy signatures, but we cannot really put this into the world of legacy signatures because they were not generated like years ago. These are signatures generated as a part of um, connection establishment, for example, right now. So. Uh, strictly speaking, you cannot apply any exceptions here. Okay, so the game is over. I can end this talk and you can spend the rest of sunny Sunday somewhere else. Well, we come back to the uh, interesting story that happened two, two months ago. <clears throat> so Microsoft actually submitted their own implementation on the test. There's a bunch of uh, crypto modules that they have to do. And obviously nothing about this talks about Active Directory because these are, like in our case, actual crypto modules that Kerberos part of um, Active Directory will use to implement their thing. So Kerberos part is basically application on top of this. But they don't have um, FIPS 140-3 certified crypto modules yet, neither us. So we all work in preparation. In addition to that, uh, on the same day, by the way, if you, if you notice, this is April 14th for the majority of it. On the same day, uh, leading Kerberos developer in Microsoft writes a blog with quite interesting content, which boils down to, hey, we need to rewrite the entire crypto stack in Kerberos implementation in Windows. And he finally mentions these um, RFC 8009, which is the um, encryption types for Kerberos, uh, allow it in FIPS 140-3. So great, there's something, finally something, that, that uh, gives us a bit of hope. And um, from, from this perspective, we, <laughs> we at least can expect that our future will be bright, finally, really. I hope. <laughs> There's too, my, too much darkness you know, right around. Right? But, of course, we live in present, and back to the present, we have the funny question is how all of this is enforced. So you have crypto modules, which are in our case, libraries that some other applications link against. These are pretty complex libraries themselves. The API they provide have certain semantics and so on. And you can configure these libraries to apply certain things. How we manage to, to make it coherent, consistent in, in what, what is supposed to be expressed by by the uh, regulatory bodies. <clears throat> so the um, easiest answer is uh, we try to isolate it all in kind of a system-wide configuration. This is not a new topic. It's uh, existing in um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and in Fedora and other 
uh, downstream distributions uh, for quite a while. Um, and the um, Cryptopolis's uh, project is effectively um, defining a set of rules, a nice set of rules that um, allows you to generate a bunch of the configuration files for these crypto libraries to apply a consistent set of rules. And it also allows the distributions to have these consistent set of rules not necessarily be the same. So, for example, what is default or FIPS in RHEL is not necessarily the same uh, as a default in Fedora, at least at this point, because Fedora has some community requirements and uh, RHEL has some um, business requirements that n not always align. It, it, that's fine. That's, that's what these policies are for. Um, there's a bunch of them, and they're used already uh, in multiple places. This is just an example how test outputs look at them. And these test outputs, they, they effectively uh, are generated configurations already. I'm not showing the original configuration. I'm showing what is generated and then loaded into the um, applications when, when the library is being initialized. Um, these libraries, they have, uh, the, the, these policies, they have a way to tune them. So uh, you can have a main policy and then can add or remove certain things within context of, of that policy. So for example, the names here, they aren't just names. Uh, behind these names, there are small snippets of the configuration called sub-policy. So, for example, this AD support in um, RHEL 9 means enabling uh, encryption types that Active Directory understands. In RHEL 8, it means also enabling the, all the encryption types that uh, Active Directory understands. Uh, but in RHEL 9, it doesn't contain uh, RC4 ciphers, for example. Um, no SHA-1 is kind of what uh, Fedora ships. Uh, by, by default, uh, the uh, default configuration in Fedora enables SHA-1, and you can add sub-policy no SHA-1 to disable that. This no SHA-1 sub-policy would make no difference in RHEL 9 because it's already no SHA-1. And you can combine, you can actually apply multiple of those and uh, have something. How these multiple sub-policies apply configuration um, matters or means something is really up to the uh, business, up to the customer and their, if this is FIPS uh, environment, their FIPS auditor to interpret and analyze. We help them by providing means but we cannot really say that they are uh, compliant in the end. We, we just provide means to be compliant. So just one example. <clears throat> when you get default crypto policy on RHEL 9, you have this uh, Kerberos configuration that has some uh, permitted uh, en encryption types. These include... Um, Encryption types from RFC 3962, uh, which means SHA-1, HMAC, based ones, and also uh, the ones from RFC 809, so the ones based on SHA-2. SHA While if you take the FIPS policy, you, you get only two encryption types from RFC 809. Y you define that the well-behaving application will only see these encryption types and only request them and therefore only operate on these uh, encryption types. This is kind of what system level, system-wide level provides. The application still needs to do something to, to operate in this environment because if you get uh, permitted encryption types that uh, you don't understand. From your perspective, there's nothing to work with. 
So the application needs to do something to, to kind of live there, right? So how this goes on the application side is that it's roughly, uh, in most cases it's tr transparent. So you init initialize a crypto library, a crypto library loads these configurations and then loads all the providers or whatever and applies these defaults. The application might change some or explicitly request certain things. But if, if the um, um, crypto module does not have implementation for a particular crypto primitive, then nothing can be done, of course. So in, in many cases, um, things are transparent, but failure is also sort of transparent. Uh, this is a new thing, for example, in uh, FIPS 140-3, the uh, indicator API. It's, it's a sort of a requirement that crypto modules have to implement. Um, not all of them yet implemented it. I know that uh, um, NSS has merged it, the, this API. The, um, um, for open SSL discussion is still open how it should look like and how it would be used, but there are always concerns that existing applications might fail simply because they not prepared to query this additional information. And it's easy if it's implicit, like if you called something, something failed, you bail out early, nothing works, that's fine. Fine in the sense that you, you see the problem early enough, you cannot log in over SSH and that's, that's all you get. But if, if for the explicit one, if application needs to be modified, it needs to have knowledge and, uh, of the API to call. And if, if there's no API, then of course, that's a bit different question. So in general, we can split all of these modernization and uh, things that happen at, at the application level in three broad categories. Uh, one of them is really, um, it's not a FIPS related, it's uh, a, a really modernization of how application handle um, their crypto operations. It's what we call algorithm agility. It's the same for being prepared for post-quantum Things same for FIPS. Basically, you have to be able to negotiate certain operations using certain. Be prepared that the uh, actual algorithms might change. Be prepared to negotiate these changes between client and server in a way that doesn't break you if these algorithms change. As long, ideally, as long as your libraries, your crypto modules provide these primitives and you are able to discover and negotiate them and operate on, on them. Uh, you ideally should be good. The uh, truth is that it's not always where we are. The other part is defaults. Um, it's nice to have uh, self-adjusting defaults. So crypto policies is one of uh, possible mechanisms to give you self-adjusting defaults. If, if the uh, policy uh, profile changes, then application kind of automatically adjusts to not accept what's not accepted in the policy. Um, but then we get to the trouble of how to migrate data that was created before the policy change happened. And all of those three in the broad strokes, they all have um, nightmares, they all have happy days, and they all have probably a business that failed to, to operate, right? And a lot of pressure from the uh, people who upgraded and, and nothing works anymore. So as usual, planning for that is, is the key, and planning in advance is the key as well. I just want you to remind, uh, remember that the FIPS 140-2 was accepted 21, 22 years ago. So we happily forgot how this all work happened. And we as uh, computer uh, society, IT 
uh, technology companies, uh, open source communities, and so on. We do, do have work to do. And we forgot how we did that work in the past because we changed generations of developers, we changed technologies and so on. And sometimes it's too late to come with this, hence urgency to fix. Sometimes this is probably we have some time until 2030, December 31, 2030, to, to get rid of SHA-1 in, in all remaining obscure uh, corners of our software. But of course, what we're doing now is basically fixing the broad strokes. Like whatever we can cover as, as much, but then there are still things missing or be discovered only when you actually have to do that work. So uh, with the uh, application modernization and the uh, algorithm agility, the main problem is not changing the code. The main problem is agreeing where we are going and how we will be changing. In most cases, these things start with protocols. Protocols, they often defined by some consensus across the industry, across um, different, again, bodies, ITF and uh, W3C and, and all the others. Changing standards is a slow process especially in the uh, crypto area. Updating RFCs to remove certain things is a long time. Even if everybody agrees that certain things needs to be moved on, it still takes time to, to do that. So this is part of what you need to do, Just not just changing the code, you also have to upgrade uh, specifications and work on it. And sadly, in many cases, this part is forgotten maybe in, in a hope that somebody else does it. Not, it's not my job, right? <laughs> that's, that's a common problem. We always forget about that. It's us as a community of uh, professionals have to do this. So the other problem is, sure, adjusting implementation takes a lot of time. Uh, for any submission in this kind of crypto area, you have to do a lot of analysis of the code, uh, just purely to not slip errors and security problems uh, as a part of that. Then adjusting it in a such way that the old deployments can at least be migrated uh, to new ones, or at least can interoperate as a part of it. Uh, maybe with the backports to the old code base and so on. This uh, blog by Steve Cyphers also had a, a small note in it when somebody asked, it, is Microsoft working on, on these <coughs> changes that they will be backported to Windows Server 2012, 2016, and 2022, or it will be a purely what they call V-next, so next major version. The answer is we work for next major version. So how we do the backports is, is unclear. We meaning those developers. And of course, new deployments like RHEL 9 have to accept existing working systems that don't have this new uh, implementations. So that's, that's the set of challenges we deal with or have to deal with. And there is one example we want to show you um, today. It's how we handled it so far with the uh, Kerberos PKI init um, protocol extension. This is effectively using smart cards to authenticate over Kerberos. So Julian, please take over. Yes, in it actually the PKInit, yeah, so PKInit is basically an extension for the Kerberos protocol for certificate authentication, and it's indeed a good example of the kind of trouble you might run into where you do, you're trying to comply with the new FIPS restriction. Uh, so it's basically an issue of algorithm uh, agility, and uh, especially two in two areas, the signature types, like the hashing function that I use is in signature types, and the parameter groups that I use for 
um, Diffie-Hellman key exchange process, processes. Uh, basically, they, they are three of them uh, that are standardized in the RFC. Group 2, group 14, and group 16, the two first ones being mandatory to, to implement. Uh, so, and even when you have um, stuff standardized in the RFC that are sufficient to, to comply with a fixed rep uh, restriction, it may actually not be enough because uh, there are sometimes areas in the RFC that are not kind of <laughs> ambiguous in the way they are defined, so it tends to create um, a different understanding of the RFC depending on the, uh, the vendor implementing the, these libraries. This has been typically the case for uh, picking it uh, with uh, uh, algorithm agility for signatures. Uh, they have been, uh, vendor RFC has been understood differently uh, by the OpenSSL team and by the Heimdall team for their implementation, which resulted basically in some uh, cases where uh, interoperability was not just possible. Uh, and basically, even when there are AFC available that uh, provide some way to comply with the fixed requirement, the issue is all the implementation, they don't necessarily implement all of them because um, usually there's one RFC and then new RFC are added on top of it to add new, uh, new, uh, new um, algorithm, new mechanism. And this is an issue we face in Kerberos because so we, we have MIT implementation, the Heimdall one, and the, uh, the Active Directory one, which uh, also has this whole set of, uh, of specifications that are different from the RFC ones. So we, we basically made all kinds of issues uh, uh, because of that. The fact, for example, for example that uh, algorithm agility is not fully implemented for signature in, um, in MIT Kerberos still in PKNIT. There is no support for ECC certificates at the moment. Uh, and on the AD side, they are still, we are still limited to SHA-1 signature for PKNIT uh, because that's uh, what all they support for, uh, for RSC keys in the process of Diffie, Elman, K exchange. Uh, and there something else we are we are kind of concerned about it's that uh, we currently have two slightly different implementation of uh, OpenSSL FIPS provider, the upstream one and the downstream rail one. And we suspect we might eventually have yet others implementation from different, uh, different uh, distributions. And this is something we are worried because we might end up with a situation where it's difficult for our system administrator to figure out what is the proper configuration they should apply for their own environment because they, there might be a different recommendation in case the certification lab, they don't come up with the, the same uh, requirements. Like basically they have different implementation of the uh, understanding of the FIP, the FIP standard. Yeah, and, and the interesting mm -hmm. part here is that if you look into the uh, implementation of the test crypto modules list, uh, you, you will find that every single rail downstream rebuilt, like Rocky, Alma, every single other Linux distribution uh, from Canonical, from SUSE, they all have submitted their own crypto modules for the certification. Which means that e even, if, even if they have um, maybe a similar code base, I'm sure that they will have differences uh, because they use maybe different labs and they have different state of the patches that they apply. Hopefully they actually check each other, uh, whatever is uh, available. Uh, and try to kind of synchronize. But in my experience, there's also a uh, kind of tendency not to look at the application level problems until you get actual things certified. And then people discover these problems. Um, so I go through some like more practical example of what's, uh, what has been, what has done wrong basically in the, pro in the, in the process of, 
uh, complying with, uh, with with restriction. Uh, we went through a, uh, a few issues with Heimdall. One of them was the um, support for the, um, uh, the well-known groups for Diffie Hellman key exchange, which is part of the PKNIT process. Uh, the thing is, uh, we, uh, the group two is not actually supported by the OpenSSL library because it's considered too uh, too weak as a, as a crypto, basically. But it's still used as a default by Heimdall for for picking it. So this has caused some uh, some interoperability issue. We basically fix right now by um, recommending to change the configuration on on the Heimdall side. Uh, there is also, of course, the SHA-1 signature issue. Uh, at the moment, uh, win Windows implementation of Kerberos does not support any newer uh, ver um, version of SHA for, uh, RS, uh, for RSA key, uh, key exchange as, as part of Diffie Hellman. We hope we might be able to fix that by supporting uh, elliptic uh, curve cryptography for um, Diffie Hellman in the, in the future. It's currently being worked on upstream. Uh, and this is an issue we also have for the previous implementation of um, Kerberos on older versions of RHEL because um, I mentioned it earlier, uh, there's still not proper algorithm agility in, uh, in MIT Kerberos for, uh, for signatures. So it's still basically hard coded in the code. So, so far we upgraded to uh, SHA-1 signature, but older version they s will still produce SHA-1 signature. You have to to um, to, um, to verify in case you still have this host on your on your in your environment. Uh, yeah, this is also so a few words about uh, how it's supposed to be implemented. Uh, algorithm signature algorithm agility as part of PKNIT. There is this uh, super supported CMS type attrib attribute that is supposed to basically provide a list of all the, the signature algorithms that are supported by a certain client, by a certain agent, actually. And uh, so the, the issue with MIT Kerberos right now is it, it will always generate a SHA-2 signature. It will advertise the fact it understands the SHA-2 signature, but it will not take the uh, supported CMS type uh, attribute from other agent into account. Um. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is um, basically an uh, explanation of how we deal with uh, the fact we have to integrate some exception in the um, in the crypto in the FIPS crypto policy for Kerberos in case you still want to uh, achieve inter interoperability with Active Directory, as um, I mean until IH2 is actually implemented by by Microsoft. The issue is this algorithm like um, SHA1 or others they are not part of the FIPS provider. Which is the one you, you that is available by default when you use when you uh, use OpenSSL. So the approach simply is to use uh, uh, library context and load the provider that would uh, that is uh, making the algorithm you need available. So and this is um, so this is in fact bypassing the limitation of the provider, but this is still controlled by uh, actually still controlled by the by the crypto library. That's, what these uh, modules like AD support or AD support legacy are, are for. They will basically modify the Kerberos configuration and uh, basically allow to, to use this uh, bypass method to, to access this algorithm. And so a few words about the incoming version of um, Kerberos 1.21. It's actually already released on? Yes. All right, yeah. So it adds uh, a few things, like basically upstream is actually quite cooperative in the not FIP support, but at least modify, uh, accepting some modification in the code base for making our life easier in the, in the process of complying with it. So they, uh, for example, they allowed us to make the importing of some well-known groups optional, like typically the group two, which is not provided by OpenSSL. 
it has been causing some issue because the, the PKNet module would just fail to load in case it was not possible to, to, to load this group, so they accepted to do this kind of modification to allow us to uh, allow the plugin to, to work nonetheless. So Alexander will be giving some details about um, encryption type compatibility between Active Directory and, mm -hmm. and MIT cameras. So this is, so far was just PK in it which is admittedly one of the complex parts of, of this thing. But there's another one, so specific to Active Directory. Um, Active Directory issues Kerberos tickets that have additional information. That information is really crucial to have the environment where basically uh, uh, your Kerberos identity tied to your system identity. There were, in past two years, a number of um, issues, uh, security problems, that cause it specifically breakthrough um, in the environments where you have Active Directory and Linux systems in, uh, working with each other. Features of uh, Active Directory allow, for example, to um, each user to enroll machines, like enroll in additional machines. There is a quota of like 10 machines or so. So some users uh, find out that if they call a machine as a Unix user, then a certain behaviors within Active Directory allow them to create machine with, let's say, name root, and then use identity of this machine to log in as root on any other Linux machine enrolled in Active Directory. So to fix these kind of problems, Microsoft added additional checksums that over certain fields and uh, in, in the Kerberos packet and fixed some parts on their side. We worked together, uh, Samba team, uh, Microsoft, Red Hat, and few other uh, vendors worked together to fix this more than a year. Uh, released it in, I think, 2021 in November. Then after that, um, some researcher found out that, well, some of these checksums, a different checksum, is, uh, can be attacked with pre-imaging attack. And that kind of pre-imaging attack existed there for 15 years. Nobody noticed it when the specification was written. So Microsoft came again with a new release in November last year, introducing yet another checksum. While working on fixing some of these things, we found out that, hey, we switched to, um, on, on free APA side, we switched to use the uh, uh, SHA-2 encryption types, and that means these checksums will be done with the SHA-2 uh, signatures. And suddenly, Microsoft servers reach, uh, started to reject these tickets. We reported to Microsoft, and f apparently they only check, not the checksum, they check the size of the buffer. If that size of the buffer is different from what they expect for SHA-1 checksum, it's a failure for them. So when we reported, they were working already on introduction of the new checksum and some other semantic changes. After they released these uh, fixes, we find out that they silently fixed this problem as well. So now we can apply this checksum. But at that time, we already added functionality, which is part of uh, 121 release, to, to allow uh, KDC to tell or hint that, hey, when you're talking to Active Directory, you can change the uh, uh, encryption type to a different one, just for that one, um, so that you can keep being interoperable. This will not be needed in the case when they finally uh, support the RFC 809, because, well, then we can use SHA-2 based encryption types. But still, for the older systems, we have to keep this. Uh, maybe these older systems will not live beyond uh, November this year when Microsoft uh, announced that they want to everyone to switch to the new builds which introduce this new checksum uh, that prevents the uh, pre-imaging attack. But these are things that, that we have to deal. This is not kind of FIPS, but it's dri driven by our investigation how to make it all work in the FIPS mode. 
And um, then if we move forward, we already work at like for five years with Microsoft. Uh, they have plenty of different um, remote procedure calls, implementing all kinds of operations, like creating user, setting a password on the user, replacing certain things, mutual authentication between machines and uh, domain controllers and so on. Most of that was still using RC4 in, in the operations. So some of these operations changed semantics. Well, they introduced new versions of those operations, basically requiring AES-based session key. Then using that AES-based session to operate with whatever is there, which is, uh, I think, a, 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 a type of uh, activity that is allowed in FIPS because you have a secure channel using the approved uh, cryptography and what's inside this channel it's considered plain text kind of operation. So, but still for some of them we still need access to RC4 just to perform some of that plain text operation. And then we also don't want to leak um, encrypted material, the, the passwords and so on, then creating it. So had to refactor some, but to change the code in a such way that it generates cryptographically strong uh, passwords, for example, for trust between different AD domains and never leaks it to the application. So it's always the, this library handles it. Um, and ensures that whatever is handled is always handled under um, AES-based session. So it's still not enough for FIPS 140-3, but we really hope that uh, the work they are doing in uh, refactoring their Kerberos crypto stack will result in more changes. And of course, on Samba side, we cannot do more uh, until they do publish these specs and uh, actually do this work. So <clears throat> we are still in the process of doing that. Now to the defaults. Um, new installations are kind of easy. You change defaults, new installations basically take them. And for example, an IPA changed the default installation using the master key for Kerberos with the new encryption types. Fine, works okay. Um, the same encryption types as before, default policy blocks them, so uh, KDC instantly uh, kind of not allowing to use them. But for the new installation, you don't have any new, uh, any old uh, keys at all. You have users being created or machines enrolled, you, you get new stuff generated. And for the uh, kind of um, Migration environment, uh, if users had old keys and old passwords, change of the password will use new scheme. It automatically upgrade the uh, hashes. But um, there are a few things that kind of fell through, uh, uh, fell through on this. So for example, FreeAPA supports uh, one-time password. So using the uh, HOTP or TOTP tokens, um, even software tokens, to, um, to use. And the, the standard still says SHA-1 is uh, there. SHA-1 in, in this context using SHA-1 is okay because it's not cryptographical uh, kind of operation that matters here. But uh, you cannot load SHA-1 from the FIPS provider. So you cannot really use it. You need to uh, do this dance of loading in another provider and uh, in a different context to, to be able to, to operate it. And even then, it's not available if the uh, default policy is not allowing you to, to use it by default. So the worst part here is not that we cannot fix our site. We can it's that the other software will not work. For example, Google Authenticator only understands SHA-1-based uh, tokens. If you switch to a different, and people are switching to a different uh, tokens using SHA-256 or 512 and so on, um, 
they cannot use Google Authenticator. Strangely enough, everybody else is kind of implementing a wider specter because it's, it's easy to have a different SHA functions uh, hashes used there. So these kind of things, they appear uh, from the field testing. Finally, data migration. So if you have old systems and you add new systems, you, you're supposed to have business continuity. The uh, replicated data from the old system kind of continues to be useful uh, in the new ones. So on RHEL 8, if you have a system installed with in FIPS mode uh, with IPA, we don't ship Samba AD, so I'm using IPA example here. If you add RHEL 9 in FIPS 140-3, in general, you shouldn't expect things working, but they kind of not working. Right, because what, what was allowed in 140-2 is not allowed anymore in 140-3. So in case of Samba, which is more relevant to other distributions and Fedora and Debian and so on, um, they actually have uh, actual plain text of the password encrypted in the database Samba uses GPG to wrap all these blobs and so on, so they always stored encrypted, but um, they, they have access to that. So administrators can regenerate keys for the users <clears throat> using new materials. It's all sort of possible to do, uh, well, when Microsoft introduces support for those uh, new encryption types because they have to be compatible with the Windows machines and Windows machines are not supporting them yet. But in this imaginary case, yes, you can do all of this stuff uh, because you have all the materials. Also for the uh, <clears throat> domain members, so machines that enroll, they actually have their plain text uh, credentials uh, encrypted on the machine so they can, can regenerate and mutually authenticate with the uh, domain controllers. In the uh, free IPA case, it's more interesting because we, we, first, we don't have plain text passwords anywhere. On the Kerberos level, we have uh, Kerberos encryption uh, keys, and on the uh, LDAP passwords, we actually have hashes. So there's nothing to, to generate from. Of course, uh, there is a mechanism to uh, transparently upgrade from LDAP uh, bind, where in LDAP bind uh, you can take a plain text password and apply the older scheme, uh, see that the hashes are actually compatible, um, compare them and so on, and then re-encrypt. This is what we're doing already in the uh, plain uh, Red Hat uh, directory server case, so it's possible. But the problem here is that FreeIPA supports more than passwords. FreeIPA supports non-password based authentication, which you cannot do over LDAP. So um, token based OTP, HOTP is supported, but we are working on, well, smart cards are not supported. They support it only through the Kerberos. So you have to solve it there. But luckily a smart card means you don't have password. You have a cryptographic device and possibly a pin there and pin applies to the device not to the uh, something here so this problem is not existing there at all and we are working on introducing uh, FIDO2 support so we're both uh, uh, authentication and that means these these kind of keys will also be supported um, and they also don't have Passwords. So that's the best way. Maybe at this point, you just start thinking about migrating all of your users into non-password non uh, based authentication and solve it. But of course, to migrate the old system or to apply these changes from and, and keep the old system working, you have to extend policies. And this is where uh, sub-policies become really crucial. You can extend the sub-policy, do migration, because this allows to accept the old keys and, and so on. 
migrated everything, changed the policy back, restarted the server, you are now in the new world. Of course, that has to be FIPS from scratch on the old systems, FIPS from scratch on the new systems, um, but it at least provides you a path forward. So, on the client side, it's also a bit easier because um, you have host keys, you can rotate them, you can automate things. Again, the same crypto policies, system-wide crypto policies applied there uh, consistently. Well, if you have uh, in-use distributions where you don't have crypto policies, then, well, uh, my suggestion is to uh, work with the uh, maintainers of those distributions to really raise your needs for them as developers and also as users. Because to me, frankly, this is one of the uh, best non-upstreamed yet um, extensions that Red Hat Crypto team uh, made. And um, then the other thing is um, you can switch to the certificates. Um, FreeIPA supports enrollment using certificates now. So you can use, instead of one-time passwords or passwords of admins and so on, you can use uh, PKI init based um, enrollment of the systems. Re-enroll the system and you get everything in place. And you can use this also to rotate the keys. There's pretty flexible way of achieving this. You can get quite well with this. So that's literally all we have. Of course, there's a lot of work to do and the focus here is more on getting you a bit of light into what what is in those dark uh, forests are. And um, any questions? Yep. Uh, my question is, uh, I would like to use an observe uh, uh, from the discussion uh, about this mode, a proactive way, for some, uh, for example, Microsoft is saying it gives some new requirements, and this mode is a new requirement. And is the discussion So the question is, uh, ha has there been any discussion with, uh, about FIPS requirements with uh, Microsoft, you said? Yeah, for example, yeah. yeah, or the other industry parties. Has this discussion been public or private? Um, yes and no. So we, we try to discuss um, in many places. Um, there are, for example, for Kerberos, there is a kit and work group at IETF that uh, handles the uh, protocol evolution and, and things. And Microsoft came forward recently there with some of their concerns and they were discussing, not related to FIPS directly, but you can deduce from the discussion that they concern it on, on this migration thingy. A major concern for Microsoft is that they still have to support configurations where they don't use Kerberos, where um, NTLM is being like a, a fallback, and they cannot easily disable that fallback, and they want to des design something new there. Um, there are some discussions that we do, in particular Julian, uh, in, in the... Um, uh, um, uh, open SSL upstream, uh, Heimdall, uh, Kerberos upstream with the um, uh, MIT upstream. This is all in public, in, in the pull requests or issues on, on the uh, project sides. So this part, uh, Julian works also on the updates in the RFCs for these uh, mod P group requirements. Uh, hopefully we will get this forward. So Clemens uh, adds a comment that there is a cryptographic model users forum 
Oh, I think it's on GitHub, right? Uh, on some page. Yeah, yeah. This is the place where NIST and labs and all other uh, module implementers collaborate. It's, it's the public one. Exactly. Um, Dmitry makes a comment that um, disagreements on interpretation of RFCs should ultimately end in the working groups by producing uh, fixes and modifications to those RFCs so that they are actually readable. And I fully support that. And I should refer to my slide where I write that this takes years and we probably should start yesterday. With, with this clarification side. I also should clarify that why we care about Heimdall while we do not ship Heimdall. For us, Heimdall represents a client. Mac OS uses Heimdall as its Kerberos implementation. And if you don't have Mac OS systems working against your uh, server, then you get calls from customers, right? Post-quantum. Yeah. But fortunately, Kerberos only cares about PK and it for post-quantum. You don't have any signatures, right? Yeah. In the main part of the, of the protocol, no. Yeah. We, yeah. Can you answer? No? So the, um, the specs are, call it, the, the question is how agile is agility, uh, agility in the uh, PK and it RFCs? The answer is not much. Uh, they establish some level of flexibility uh, among the explicitly specified algorithms, not the new ones. So um, the, some work on extending them will be needed. Uh, with the um, context of uh, post-quantum, this also means that some work will be needed on actually defining what certificates mean in terms of post-quantum crypto. And that is quite unclear at this moment because the whole story with what are certificate chains would be what format and what not, it, it's all unclear. I guess all this work on specifying that is also waiting for more definitive answers from uh, regulatory bodies. Yes, and a comment from, from Bob is that uh, a general guidance is to extend as, as much as possible the uh, RFCs to accept um, algorithms and, and whatever is, is there, even though uh, the um, exact um, algorithms for signatures or certificates are not uh, fully set in stone yet. And I, I fully agree with that. Just adding something. Uh, there are some mechanisms in place for, for agility. The, uh, the main issue is that, uh, in PKNIT case, uh, that there are actually three RFCs, the original one that um, includes support for RSA with SHA-1 signature. There was a, a second one that were adding new, new um, hash functions, so basically the SHA-2 function. Uh, and there is also the... DFI Hellman elliptic curve support for uh, PKNIT. The thing is that Microsoft basically skipped the implementation of the second one, adding a new, uh, new version of SHA2 for, um, for RSA based signature, so they move right to the ECDH one. So this is why we are, this, we are in this case right now, where in MIT Kerberos we only have support for the RSA based signature, 
So the only one we have in common with Microsoft at this point is the ERISA with SHA-1. So this, this is what this whole issue is about. So, but we, we, are, we, sh we are currently work done upstream for supporting the ECDH RFC, so hopefully we can uh, fi fix this issue relatively soon. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, so um, you mentioned on one of the slides that uh, um, TOTP and HOTP were using SHA-1 and uh, for that reason you couldn't use them anymore. Um, small correction on that, that's not entirely correct. You can use SHA-1 for hashing, not for hashing that's being used in signatures, which isn't the case in TOTP as far as I know, um, but that's, you know, a time thing by 2030. Will be dead completely, so yeah, I hope I hope we get we get there easy. Yes, the the question was uh, or correction was that uh, strictly speaking, FIPS 140-3 allows to use um, SHA-1 in the uh, in the way how TOTP HOTP is is using it. Uh, I think our main trouble is that uh, we do not have access to SHA-1 uh, through the uh, EVP. Uh, um, it still works for hashing, it does not work for signatures. Okay, so it should be fine, but it doesn't right now. <laughs> Lisa is a bug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, that's what, we, what we see. So customers come back with uh, brave new deployments, and they finally found out that there's something not working. Okay, start investigating, it boils down to certain environment. In this case, it wasn't even FIPS, it was SHA-1 disabled by default in, in RELI. Yeah, REL 9. the bug I submitted on Friday. <laughs> 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 but that, that was actually related to CMS, so s that's, that's a different one. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a bunch of... Okay. <laughs> yeah, the comment was that uh, just a bug submitted on Friday around a similar topic uh, where there is a difference between FIPS and non-FIPS, but FIPS works, non-FIPS doesn't. <laughs> so, so, yeah, as you can see, this is really a kind of fluid and agile area with problems coming and going in, in, in a matter of days. <laughs> Overall, um, I think we are almost done, two minutes to end. And any more questions? Yep. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, OpenSSL has both uh, the implicit and explicit uh, identifiers, uh, like the, when the algorithm is rejected uh, in fifth mode. Uh, do you prefer one or the other approach for that? So the question is, uh, I mentioned that OpenSSL has indicators. Uh, I actually mentioned that indicators are not fully implemented in our upstream OpenSSL. The pull request is still open, uh, but the um, implementation of indicators is a requirement of uh, FIPS 140-3, so I expect them to appear in some form. Um, regardless, uh, the, and the question is uh, which one we prefer. Um, it really depends on the situation. Uh, I cannot answer in advance. In, in the case of Kerberos, we've been relying on implicit ones. So if we get uh, rejection, we try another path um, by loading a separate context and loading a separate provider in the case that we know this is the problem. Um, for the um, explicit one, I yet need to find a specific case where this will be absolutely required. But I know that there are cases like, I think, SSH uh, server uh, negotiation, um, but I, I'm, I'm not the person to go into details on that. Yeah. And we're done.